morning, church. Come on, let's stand together as we sing and we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. So put your hands together with us. Come on, let's sing. And this is where you stir my desperation. And this is where all my striving seems. think that's a great way to start the day, don't you? Lord, we come, we gather into this place, and our one request is that you would do, Jesus, what only you could do. I love that. It's a great way to kick off our time together. Welcome to Prestonwood. I love seeing all of your beautiful, smiling faces out there. Do you ever take a minute in the worship service and just look around? It's amazing to see the diversity and people from all different walks of life and history, and we come and we gather, and in this moment, we gather as a unified body, and God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he comes and he meets with us here, and that's why we say, do what only you can do, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff we might be able to do in our own power, and our own strength, but what God can do, it outshines it all, amen? 
Amen. So we're glad that you're here with us. Um, if you're new or newer to our church, if you're our guest today on the way in, you received a press in with today. And on the right side of that is a little connection card. Uh, we'd love for you to take a moment to fill that out. And in just a few moments, you can drop it in the offering plate as it goes around. As a matter of fact, if you're our guest today, that's all we want from you to drop in that plate today. Or better yet, you can take it out to the atrium after service. And our team out there would love to just put a face with the name. And we've got some free gifts for you, okay? Everybody loves free stuff. So <laughs> If you're our guest today, we invite you to go uh, meet our uh, Welcome Center out in the atrium. Okay, if you're joining us on Prestonwood.live as well, we're glad that you're with us. Jump into our chat room there and say hello to the team there and to the brave men and women of our armed forces joining us from around the world. Know that we love you. We're praying for you. We thank God for your service. Hey, church, before we sing some more, do me a favor. Find a few people around you. Give them a nice, bright smile and let them know you're glad to see them, okay? Let's do that.
I mean, I love the truth of that song. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who he says that I am. And I just believe in the room this size, there have to be a lot of people with a lot of different labels. Things that people have said you were, things you've said you were to yourself, maybe when you were growing up, or maybe even last week, maybe for some of you this morning, you've just been dealing with that self-talk. And you're reminding yourself of all your sin and all your shame and all the things that are wrong that you've done. And you come in and you see that in my father's house, there's a place for me. And you think, man, never me. I've done too much. I've gone too far. But what we were just singing is the truth of God's word today. And it's real. It's not just some fanciful language that a songwriter put together. It is what the word of God says that when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, we are given a place in the family of God that can never be snatched away. We can't be relabeled as anything else but a child of God. And here's why. This is Hebrews. So before we get to this uh, chapter, let me explain what's happening here. So the writer of Hebrews is talking about the old way uh, of doing things, uh, that the children of Israel, this Mosaic law, they had this old covenant. In the old covenant, um, the priest, year after year, would have to go in and atone for the people, and the sacrifices that they offered were just, it was like over and over and over and over again. They had to make these sacrifices, and the Bible says that it's because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away the sin. So even though the, the, those sacrifices were kind of like a, a substitute for what was happening, they were also a constant reminder of sin. They were a constant reminder that, oh, we have over and over and over again. We have to be reminded of our sin. We have to make this sacrifice. But then Jesus comes on the scene and he, he does something different. The Bible says that his sacrifice was once and for all because he was sinless. He was spotless. So when he offered his sacrifice, it didn't need to be done over and over and over again. One time he came, he died. For you and for me carried our sin and our shame. And the Bible says where there's forgiveness, there's no more need for another sacrifice because his sacrifice was more than enough. And this is what it says picking up in, in verse 19. It says, this, uh, therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, that's through his death. And since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, over the house of God, and I think this applies to us this morning, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope that we have in him without wavering. And read this last uh, part together with me. For he who promised is faithful. Come on one more time, say that again. For he who promised is is faithful. And if he's promised salvation, he's faithful to do it. If he's promised deliverance, he's faithful to do it. If he's promised you a place in his father's house because you've put your faith in him, it doesn't matter what the world says, it doesn't matter what you're labeled by everyone else, he looks at you and he says you are forgiven. He looks at you and says you are loved. He looks at you and says that you are his. And so we can hold on to hope today, amen? Lord, thank you for that promise. Whatever we're walking through, whatever the world has put on our shoulders, whatever labels, things that we've been called and described as, we know that what matters most is what you say about us. And so, Lord, we thank you today for the hope that we have in you. It's a hope that surpasses everything else. And so, Lord, with the lifting of our hands and the lifting of our voices this morning, as we gather, we draw near with confidence. Not in our ability or anything that we've done, but confident in your love for us, in the grace that is available to us this morning. And we say that we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only lean on 
Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. On love the ground is sinking sand. On love the ground is sinking sand. And when the darkness fails, His lovely face. I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds with Him I'll sing on Christ On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground sinking sand shall come and when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then hear dressed in his righteousness his righteousness alone for let's just stand before the throne on Christ the side Sing it out on Christ. Your son, Christ, the silent rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Thank you, Lord. We are confident. Christ the solid rock, the hope of our salvation, an anchor for our souls, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God, I'm no longer of God. Would you sing that with us? I'm no longer a slave to fear. We have the victory. For I am a child. I'm everything he says about. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. The seas, you split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. Come on, he's rescued us today. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Boy, you split the sea.
thank you, Lord, for your promises, which are yes and amen. Lord, you who have promised is faithful. And we sing today with joy. We sing today with faith and an expectation that you are going to come through on every promise that you've given us. We say we love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. So glad you came to church this morning. You can take your seats. And as we prepare to give, um, our pastor has a special message for us. Shabbat Shalom from Israel. We're at the place where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, and Jarrett just uh, gave a great message uh, on Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so our hearts are uh, really warm. We're, we're excited about what God's doing with us here. But we're also thinking about you back home and uh, the Saturday and Sunday services at uh, Prestonwood. We wanted to greet you. We want to tell you how thankful we are for each one of you. This has been a phenomenal year, hasn't it, Jared? It really has. And as we close out 2018 and move forward into 2019, we just want to encourage you to finish this year strong and let's start the new year strong. Absolutely. And uh, a part of finishing strong as uh, we get ready to receive the offering today uh, is to make sure that our giving is where it needs to be. We are a generous church and you are an incredibly generous people. And as we finish well, uh, we've said before, it's important in these last four or five days of the year that with our church budget, our ministry, which is the engine that uh, runs the entire ministry, that we make sure that we take care of that. And I know that you're praying about that. I would simply ask you at this offering time, at the end of the year and in the next few days, to consider uh, your very best to the Lord. Uh, what we uh, read about in the Sermon on the Mount is just truly putting Jesus first in our lives, and that includes, of course, our possessions. So thank you, Preston Wood, for always being uh, the kind of church that God can use by giving and serving, and let's finish 2018 and on to 2019 with, uh, with great joy and great victory in our hearts. Well, I'm going to invite our men forward as they get ready to serve us, and I'm going to pray, and we'll give, and we'll sing some more. Lord, we are grateful for every blessing that you've given us, and Lord, as we give today, we do it with cheerful hearts. Lord, you've given us so much, and we thank you that what we give today goes not to just impact our neighborhoods around here, or even the state of Texas, the great state of Texas, but it goes all around the world to reach those that need the gospel and the love and the message of Jesus Christ. And so we give today and we thank you for the ability to do so in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you as you give.
Well, that was good. That was wonderful. So grateful for Brian and all those uh, musicians and singers and everybody, and thankful for you. Thanks for being here today on this uh, last Sunday of the year as we look forward to uh, next year. And uh, I'm, uh, Neil Jeffries my name, and I'm, I guess I'm in charge here at Prestonwood today because <laughs> everybody else is gone. They're in Israel. They're they're doing whatever they're doing, and uh, I'm here, Jeff's here, uh, Michael's here, David's here, and Scott, and Jason, and that's about it. Everyone else is gone. And uh, <laughs> so I like to say, I'm going to make some changes around here, get some things, get some things done. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, uh, I am honored to get to preach today, and I've, I've, it, it just kind of happened. I've uh, preached the last uh, uh, a few, uh, this uh, Sunday. Uh, at the end of the year, as we begin a, a new year, and so it's kind of, kind of uh, 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 fun for me. I always feel I need to warn you that I, I am a stutterer. All that means is that I stutter, <laughs> and I'm actually a good stutterer. I stutter well, and I've stuttered all my life as a kid. I mean, I stuttered. Uh, I couldn't even cry good as a baby. I stuttered so good, and I stuttered. <laughs> Couldn't talk on the phone. I used to, uh, people used to call the house and I'd, I'd, I'd pick up the phone, couldn't never get anything. I'd just hang up on them. And I <laughs> used to, all the way through school, affected me. I mean, I stuttered everything about school. Was a Reading was a challenge for me. Everything about school was, was tough. And uh, I, uh, of course, a speech class, I mean, I struggled. That, that was a major adventure for me. And of course, Spanish, I took a Spanish class as a sophomore in high school. And, and if you can imagine me stuttering in English, you should have heard me stutter in Spanish. It, it was incredible. But, I say all of that just so you'll know, hey, I'm a stutter, I do stutter, I will stutter, and uh, uh, although I'm starting off really well, and I'm not, um, but I just know that, that if I get stuck and stutter a little bit, just wait, because eventually something's coming, and that's, that's, that's what I want you to know. You know, something else, and, and you know, I'm, I'm too honest, I'm too open, and Sheila gets on me that all the time, but, uh, you know, I, I learned in the seminary, if uh, you're supposed to uh, preach with your uh, jacket buttoned, of course, nowadays, a lot of guys don't even wear jackets anymore, but, but it just, um, it's just a little tight there today. And so, so, I mean, I've been eating too much, and I admit it, I get that right out in front of everybody. I'm too much, the jacket's too tight, so I'm not going to button it. I'm going to lay it over today. Just, just, I felt like I need to get that off my chest, you know. All right, here's what we're going to do real quick. Don't, uh, I tell you about how I said that, but just, uh, here's what we're going to do. I, of course, this Sunday is always about looking back and looking ahead. Of course, we usually do an inspirational message, and I want to do an inspirational message today about starting the new year. I mean, I mean, I mean it's always something about something new, something exciting. Man, I, I want to do it again. I want, to, I want to start over. I want to maybe redo just all of And I want to do that in this, in this the message. And, and, of course, actually, the, the point of this message today is that the point of, of all that we do, all the things we sing, the, why this church is even here, is ultimately, hey, we want you to know the greatest gift God ever gave, which is the gift of His Son, the Lord Jesus. To know Him, to experience Him in your life, to experience life in Him, because it changes everything. It does. And um, I want to challenge you t t today, and, and, and ultimately, it's it's essentially a pep talk. And of course, I love pep talk. I played sports. I loved when I was a player. I loved hearing a pep talk just for a big game and you're nervous, excited. You got all this and you get this pep talk. You get fired up and ready to play. And of course, now I'm an old guy. I love giving them. I mean, I, I, I've spoken in every high school in North and Central Texas before games. And I love firing up a group of guys. Hey, go out there and you play. It's awesome. We well, you know what he said. That's what I want to do today. 
as we face a new year and the challenges of a new year and the opportunities of a new year, the struggles of a new year and the pain, I mean, this, this next year um, could be the greatest year of your life. I've got to get my water. This next year may be the worst year of your life. But you know, as a follower of Jesus Christ, in one sense, it doesn't matter. Amen. What I want to do is faithfully follow Jesus Christ. I want to, want to and, and what I want to do, and this, and this may be weird, but I want to look at the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2. Now, I know we're done with Christmas, and, and some of you are saying, oh, I don't want to go back and do what we've done with that. But what I want to do is look at these two people, Mary and Joseph, two average human beings, that God did something incredible in their life. And you know, and I mean, it, it was supernatural. It, it, was, it was huge. And all they did was just trust in the God who gave them this word. And God accomplished it fully, completely, totally. And we still celebrate that. We rejoice. I mean, we have songs about that. We have plays and drama about that. Our whole musical thing was centered around what happened in, in this story. But the point is, God used these two people. And what I want to do is just encourage us because you know what? Just like God gave them something back then, God has given us something. Of course, we have the Lord Jesus. We have an assignment here on earth. And the same things that challenge them are going to challenge us. Here are the three ideas I want us to have as we do this. As we look at this story, and, and, and these are what happened to them, I believe, but this is the inspiration for us as we go forward in 2019. One is, hey, I'm going to have a positive attitude this year about what anything that happens in my life. You know why? Because God is bigger than anything and everything, and my God is in control. And life's a struggle. Things are tough. It, it can be messy. There are challenges. But because my God is in control, I'm going to rejoice. And I know all this is according to his plan and purpose, and I'm just going to trust him through it all, whatever it is, until the very end. And the fact is, God did a miracle. Because in the midst of all of this, God did what he wanted to do, and the baby was born. Exactly where uh, uh, he um, wanted it to be born. That's the um, end. And he wants to do something supernatural and miraculous in us. And the last word, number three, the uh, third point is, one, I'm trusting him through it all. Two, God's going to do something supernatural. And three, and, 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 and hey, he has a word for us from heaven in all of this. So here's the story. Look, real quick, let me read this story. Luke chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you want to look at Luke chapter 2, what it be on the screen. But, but here's the story. Now, you know this story well. We all love this story. My dad used to take a Bible on Christmas morning, and we'd read this story every year. And, of course, we could care less about the story when we were looking. We just wanted the presents. But, uh, but still, he'd stop us, and we'd read this thing. You know, I did this on Christmas Day with my kids and my grandkids. I read this story. And one of those things that inspire us today. Now, real quick, let me read this story. And, of course, you know, because, and the three, uh, three uh, ideas in the story that um, my main outline is there's an earthly condition. The great event happens at the second thing. And the third, there's a heavenly response to all this. Here's how it goes. Verse 1, Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world be registered or taxed. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, of Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. All of that describes the condition here on earth of what was going on. Here's the great event. Here's what happened, verses 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, Wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. That's the event. That's the miracle. And then here's heaven's response. Here's a wood from heaven in this. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said, and here's the word from heaven, Fear not, 
For hold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you this day, this joy, this good news is because for unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You know what, ultimately, that's the whole message, verse 11, of the whole thing. There is born a Savior. Man, that's, that's the... The greatest event up until this time in the history of the world is what all of history, all the Bible looked forward to. And it's here. There is a Savior born who's Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. Verse 12, you will find a baby wrapped in swollen clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel the multitude of the heavenly host, praise of God, saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. First of the, is the earthly conditions, because you know what? Something, obviously, in that time was happening around Mary and Joseph, happening in the world, in the whole world, something was going on, and something was happening in their world and everything, obviously, and something was happening in, in them as well. And, and, of course, here it, it says there, in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus. What was happening in the world in those days were, that phrase, in those days, something was going on then. And what was going on in the world then was Rome dominated the world. And Caesar Augustus was the one who, who dominated the world. In fact, it's interesting that this, this Caesar Augustus, he's actually classically known as the first Roman emperor of the great Roman empire. Now, there were other Caesars, but those Caesars, like Julius, this guy was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. But the Caesars then were known of, of the Roman Republic. Things are kind of changing now, and Rome is becoming an empire. And Caesar is becoming more than just the leader and just what one do you, who, who's, and, and he's this first one who just takes the, the title of a Caesar, of Augustus Caesar. And in the end, they're going to drop the Augustus. It's just going to be Caesar. Ultimately, the Senate decided, hey, we want this guy to be a dictator. And Augustus says, no, I want to be more than a dictator. And they said, well, how about a king? He said, no, I don't want to be known as a king. I want more than that. And, and, and actually, he wanted to be and to see himself as a god. And, of course, Caesar, in the end, is known as essentially the one who controlled everything. He's in charge of everything. And in those days, this, it was tough just to be alive for Mary and Joseph, just a two little uh, peasant uh, people. In the midst of the uh, Holy Land, it's just hard for them just to be under the oppression of Rome. Now, there was a peace of Rome, and if things were good, and you did what they said, you could live in peace. But you didn't have much freedom. You had to do what they said, and if you didn't do what they said, they would crush you. It now is an empire, and Caesar is ruling. And it just shows his power because he makes one little decree. He makes a decree and the whole world moves. One word and boom, everybody has to leave where you are and you go to your city, which is why Mary and Joseph left Nazareth and go to Bethlehem. Now, here's my point. Caesar and Rome rules, but God is in control. God's calling the shot, not Caesar. Caesar thinks he's, and you know what, he thinks he's doing this right thing. This has been forced to told 800 years before this in Micah 5.2 because the prophecy said the babe had to be born in Bethlehem. Well, the fact is Mary and Joseph are in Nazareth. How are they going to get to, to Bethlehem? 80 miles away. That's a major, I mean, that's a journey today. That's a major, major three, four days journey. There is no way. But see, Caesar does his decree not even knowing he's not in control. Actually, he's a puppet in this whole thing, and our God is in control. Now, obviously, Mary and, and Joseph didn't fully uh, even understand all that stuff. All they're doing is just obeying God. But looking back now, we know, and all of heaven says, hey, Caesar's not Lord Jesus Christ is Lord, and our God is in control. You go forward. Hey, uh, he's in control because he is ruling. And secondly, that's why we keep going. But secondly, also in this whole thing, hey, times are hard. They are following God's will for their lives. Each of them said yes. God told Joseph, hey, uh, Joseph, uh, your uh, engaged wife, she's pregnant. 
a buddy of the Holy Spirit, but I want you to marry her anyway, and you take care of her. And you know what? He, he just obeyed. He did as, as the angel commanded him. And Mary, we know, God laid this whole thing on her in Luke chapter 1. And, and Mary said, Lord, let it to be to me as you can. Both of them said, we're going to do God's will. Well, God's will included for them this huge journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And you know what? It was a struggle. Now, just, just humanly speaking about the, of course, we love that story. We, we love, see, I mean, we had our gift of Christmas, you know, we have, have uh, Joseph and, and, and Mary on the donkey, and they come in with the child. I mean, it actually came right through there, and right through here, and it went right through. But I mean, and we, we love that. It's good. I mean, my grandkids love seeing that donkey. I mean, they love that whole thing. In fact, my little Jack, after the uh, donkey left for the rest of the show, he's only three, the rest of the show, he kept saying, hey, Papa, where'd that donkey go? <laughs> hey. Well, the, the point is, can you imagine the struggle for sweet Mary who is greatly pregnant and she goes 80 miles on her donkey, traveling on this donkey. She's pregnant, which has its whole thing. They are far from home, about to have this baby another world, and they get there and there's no room. No room in the stable. Are you kidding me? And they're alone. It's just them. They have no family, no friends, all by themselves. And all of a sudden they realize, you know, this is going to happen here in this place. There is no way. My point is this. All of that's a struggle. All of that's a challenge. All of that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a mess. But here's the point. God's in the middle of this mess. There's a greater hand moving this whole thing, even their struggle, even their pain, even their discomfort, even the, the greatest challenges for an expected mother and a new soon-to-be father with this baby. I mean, it, 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 the point is, hey, things happen like this. All of us have struggles. We had struggles in the past. We're going to have struggles. Hey, hey. This is the point. All of this is God's plan. God's going to use. That's why I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to celebrate because, because God is in the middle of this thing. And I can trust him because God is in this thing. He has a plan. He has a reason. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. It seems like there's no rhyme or reason in this thing, but I'm trusting in God. And I'm going to rejoice in whatever the circumstance because I'm just following him and his will. That's what he did. And the third thing I want you to see in this whole thing, God is in control. Mary... And Joseph, in this whole thing, they seem to be, from an earthly perspective, seem to be as insignificant as you can possibly imagine. Who was significant in this thing? Caesar was. Rome was. The Roman army was. I mean, just all these people on the move, on the road, going from place. And you got two little, a man and a woman, and on a donkey, just, just traveling, just Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows where they're going or what they're doing. I mean, just the most insignificant thing in, in the midst of all the masses of people. And they seem to have, at that moment in history, in that time, seem to have no impact on Caesar, on the Romans, Romans, and on the world around them. They seem to be totally, entirely insignificant. But the point is, they are marching under the orders of God. And you look at this woman. This woman is carrying the Son of God. And you look at this man. This man, Joseph, the passion of his life is to guard this woman and to guard this baby so he gets to where he's supposed to go and the baby is born. And the point is, all of this is happening. The fact is, this is what I want you to see. The fact is, the insignificant one in this whole thing is not Mary and Joseph. The insignificant one is Caesar. The Roman rulers and all of Rome, we don't sing about them. We don't rejoice. We sing about Mary. We sing, why? Because they are significant in this whole thing. Hey, 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 hey. Look at me. <laughs> I wanted to wake up if you were asleep. I had to go over and say, so I'm going to sleep today. Well, that's for you to wake up. <laughs> hey, why do we keep on keeping on? You know why? Our God's in control. Things don't seem as they appear to seem. 
Yes, it's a struggle. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's a messy. Yes, it's a struggle. Hey, but God is in control. I'm trusting him. I'm just obeying. God has me here for the assignment. And the fact is, there is not anything that done for the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ which is insignificant. You may feel insignificant, but that's not true. From heaven's perspective, from God's perspective, hey, hey, we got, got this, this whole thing's coming apart. <laughs> the whole thing's... Uh, hey, you may be a mother out there, and you got all these little kids at your house, and of course all your friends are doing whatever they're doing, and they're going to places, and they don't got the response, you're tied down, you're thinking, this is so insignificant, what I'm doing is what you feel, but the fact is, you know what, you're doing the most significant thing on the planet. You're investing your life, your love of Jesus Christ in these kids, and you're going to raise them. Well, that's what Mary did. Man, that's what Joseph did. The passion of his life was to love and trust and obey his God and to love his wife and to protect his wife and this baby. It's not insignificant. Hey, in the whole scheme of things, you can tell, uh, you know, in our world, what is significant, what seems to be the most significant is whatever happened on Facebook. <laughs> whatever, so whatever was doing that, that seems to be most Hey, in the whole scheme of things, from heaven's perspective, a perspective, when we get in the future looking back, the Facebook thing is going to be totally insignificant. What you do for Jesus Christ. You know what? You take a Bible early in the morning, just you, just you, nobody else. And you invest in time. You think this is no big deal. That's a big deal from heaven's perspective, what God wants to do. Hey, you share Jesus Christ with someone, and, and, and you think this is no big deal in the whole scheme of things. It is a big deal in the whole scheme of things, God says. You know what? You live and trust me as your Savior. Honor me as your Lord. You just do the right thing, even if it seems like nobody else in the whole world's going that way, but one person, you said, I'm going to do the right thing. You know what about that from God's perspective? That is huge, because nothing done in the name of Jesus Christ is ever done in vain. Hey, you keep on keeping on. You know why? You know why they did? Because God's in control. Yes, it's a struggle, but God's in the middle of all this. His, his hand is moving and shaping all this. And you know what else? It's not insignificant. That's why I'm going to faithfully follow Jesus Christ, trust and obey him, period, regardless in this new year. Regardless of what happens to me, I had, had something, I don't know if I have time for this, but just, just as a thought, just keep this in your thing. You know what? Paul talked about this in Philippians 1, 12 through 14. He had some chains. He was in, he was in prison. He was in a mess, and actually, uh, Paul said, Paul uh, actually had two years, two. Well, before I get there, let me share this. I gotta, I've got to have this in this thing. <laughs> hey, so what do you do if in the whole thing? Hey, you trust God and just be faithful. That's what Joseph did. Everything God told or the angel told Joseph, he did. God I told him, hey, you take her as your wife. He did. You keep her a virgin. You keep her pure until the baby's born. He did. You take her and the child to Bethlehem. He did. You name the child Jesus. He did. You take her and the child to Egypt because Herod's going to try to kill him. And you remain there. The book God said, he did. You protect her. You provide for her. He did. Now you can leave Egypt and return home. Because it's safe, God said. He did. Uh, you return to the land of Israel. He did. Now you go to Galilee, to a place called that. He did. You raised the boy, the boy well. He did. And he died early. We don't know what happened to him, but at the end, he, he's not there. But, but the point is, he faithfully followed God all the way to the end, regardless. He just, God said, do this. He said, yes, sir, I'm going to do it. You know about Mary? She did the same thing. And Mary went through... Now, two of the hardest experiences any human has to go through. One, she buried a husband. And two, she buried a son. And yet, through the messiest, hardest times of life, she was faithful all the way to the end. Paul had chains he talked about, but those chains were to advance the gospel, he says. Paul had a thorn, but he says this thorn, because of this thorn, I've experienced God's grace and God's power. The fact is, God used, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to this purpose. Hey, you just keep on trusting on this year. Here's the second thing. First is, you keep on keeping on regardless. 
Here's the second thing. You know what? God wants to do something supernatural in your life because he did in this story. Because you know what he did in this story? He did a miracle. The event happened. You know what happened? The baby is born. The fact is, it happened. And it was a miracle. It's impossible. And, and actually, the angel told uh, Mary in Luke chapter 1, you're going to have a baby. And Mary said, how can this be? There's no way. The angel said, hey, God's going to do this because nothing is impossible with God. And you know what happens? A miracle happens in this thing. The Messiah is born. And look at this. I want you to see this real quick. Because the event in verse 6, while they were there, this happened. While they were there. Well, you know what? It was a miracle to get everybody there. (laughs) And it's amazing who all showed up. Of course, Mary and Joseph from Nazareth, there's no way they get there, but they did. They're there. The uh, shepherds are going to show up from outside the field. The angels are going to from heaven to the the, the skies above above Bethlehem. They're going to show up. The wise men are going to show up. All that happens there. You know what the point is? It's a miracle that all this happened just the way it is. Rome can't stop this. The soldiers can't stop this. Nothing can stop this because it's the will of God. A miracle happens here. And what happens there... It's a miracle that it happened there. But what happened was the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth. And you know what she gave birth to? It says specifically there she gave birth to her firstborn son. Now, obviously, that has a little statement about her eldest child, her firstborn son. But from heaven's perspective, there's a whole lot more wrapped up in the firstborn son. This is not just her eldest son. That firstborn can also mean, uh, a, a, has a deeper meaning, a larger meaning. It means not only first in time, but first in place and in, in importance. First in order. This is the supreme one. This one who's born is Jesus the Christ, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1 15, the firstborn from the dead, uh, Revelation 1 5, says, the firstborn among many, Brethren, Romans 8 29. This is the miracle. Jesus Christ is born at the right place, at the right time, in the midst of the fullness of time in all of history. A miracle happened. A virgin gives birth to him and the Messiah. There is no way. The point is, what? God did a miracle. Because you know what? That's what God does. God does the impossible, does the improbable, the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the supernatural. God does what man cannot do. God does the impossible. And with God, everything changes. Because that's what God does. What he did then, hey, this is what I want you to realize this thing. You're going to have tough times in this new year. It's going to be, I want you to keep on keeping on because of those reasons. But second, you know what? God wants to do something above and beyond anything you can even think or imagine in your life. Hey, God wants to do something I has not seen nor has ear heard. What he wants to do in you, for you, and through you, and experiencing him. He has something supernatural he wants to do with your life in this new year now. Hey, whatever you're experiencing in Jesus Christ, the fact is, the message from heaven is he's got more he wants to do in your life. Hey. I've been, I've been alive, alive a good while. I've been in the ministry for a while. I've been a follower of Jesus Christ for a while. And Hey, just between us, if I'm honest, and mom said always be honest, you know what? I can sense in my heart that sometimes I can feel myself just kind of wandering a little bit. Or maybe just kind of coasting a little bit. Or just kind of compromising a little bit. That's not who I want to be. That's not how I want to live. I don't want to finish my life just, just kind of going through the most. Just coach. I want to experience more Jesus Christ and to have more of Him and to be more faithful to Him and more godly and more Christ. And you know what I want to experience above anything else? I want to experience a miracle in my life. Hey, do you believe God? Of course, you believe He did what He did back then, right? Do you believe He can do that now in your life? Yes, he can. Now, obviously, we always hear the word miracle and think, come, oh, I'm going to get that new job. That could be a miracle, yes, or, 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 or hit the jackpot, whatever that is, make a lot of money, whatever that is. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But, God, but, but that ultimately is not the miracle God wants to do in your life. In your, you know what he wants to do in your heart and life? He wants to make you more like Jesus. He wants to make you full of the glory of God. 
So when you walk into a room, it isn't just you walk into the room, it's the glory of God that we're going to hit in a minute. It's going to show up as well. He wants to do a whole new thing that you experience fully, what most people never experience. You experience God's peace. You feel His presence. You start living in the active, manifest presence, power of Christ in your life. You experience, and of course, He can heal. Of course, He can save, He can heal, He can make, He can do all those things. You know what? God can, God has. I pray He will again. I want more of Him in my life, uh, in my life today. And this one who was born then, the fact is, He was born then, it changed everything. When He's born in a person's life, it changes everything. Miracle happened. And there's the third thing. That's what happened on the earth. But always remember what's happening on the earth in light of what's happening in the heaven. I'm asking for a miracle in my heart and my life because God can, God will, God wants to. That's what he does. And the third, there's a heavenly activity. Because you can think, well, how am I going to keep on keeping on? How am I going to survive all this stuff that's coming my way? I'm in the midst of all this. How am I going to do this? I believe all this stuff. How's it going to happen? Well, here's the word. This is a word from heaven. This is what the angels said to the shepherds, yes, to, to all of us, it says this, and that, a shepherd's up, and all of a sudden, there's an angel there, and the first thing that happens, you know what it is? Glory of God is everywhere. God shows up. There's a light that just, just shines brightly. That's the glory of God. You know, this whole thing, this, this whole deal, this whole, all this stuff, it's all about the glory of God. That's why we do everything we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus Christ, what? For His glory. God is bigger than, it's the Shekinah glory. He's in the middle of all this thing. He shows up, that's who He is. And here's His word He says, we're almost through, stay with me. He says, first, fear not, of verse 10. That's a great word. And obviously that's a word angels said. These angels who just experienced the glory of God, and they were kind of, but it's more than that. Hey, now because of who God is and who He wants to be in your life, you don't have to fear anymore. Because fear, you know, fear dominates all of us, feels a struggle for all of us. Uncertainty about life, about experience, about finances, about health, about, about kids, about everything. Fear dominates everything. But He says, fear not. You know why He says, fear not? Well, that's the rest of the mitzvahs. He says, don't be afraid, fear not, for, why? Because I bring you good news of great joy. There's great joy in, in, in this announcement. And there's good news, and here is the good news. There is, unto you this day, there is born a Savior. That's the good news. The good news is that God now has become man. The good news is that the Son is here to help us, to indwell us, to help us through life, to do life to show us what God is like, to reveal God's love, to save us from our sins, to give us salvation. He is here now. And this is the last word because, because a, a, a Savior is going to be born. And this Savior, it, 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 they, they, they born the a Savior who's Christ the Lord. And this is the Savior who, who forgives us of our sin, who redeems us, who saves us. And He's Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the anointed one of God. He is God, and He's the Lord. He's the King of kings. That is who this is. That's why you don't have to fear. That's why there is joy. And, and this is the last thing they say, and this is awesome. He says, to us, hey, I want you to look at this, because I'm not making this up. Verse 12, he says, all that he says, and this will be a sign for you, and this is the point. He tells them where you're going to find. You can find him. You can find this Savior, this Christ, this Lord, this Messiah. You can find Him. You will find a babe in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and sons and multiples. He tells them exactly where. Here's the word. Here's the word for us. Here's the one. You keep on keeping on. Hey, don't be afraid, God says. Now, that's not me telling my little kid, which I say, hey, you don't have to be afraid of this. This is the God of the universe. In the midst of all of His glory, saying, don't be afraid, because I'm here. I am with you. And he says, there's great joy, because there's now is a Savior. God is with us, a Redeemer. We can now be saved, forgiven. 
Our biggest problem is sin. Well, there's a solution to sin. It's the Savior. And he said you can be made new, live life in all of its fullness, and there's eternal life. And here's the fourth thing. He can be found. I found him when I was 16 years old. I asked him in my life. <laughs> you can find him. Because you know where he is right now? This is what the old preacher used to say in this that old painting. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. If you know what, if you're asking, man, if you confess your sin, he'll step out of heaven and he'll step into your heart. He'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you, he'll make you a new man or woman in Christ, and he'll start that whole process of giving it something in you, just like he did Mary. Because now Jesus Christ is not just in her being born, humanly speaking, now that Christ is in me, being born alive spiritually uh, in me, and now he's got something he wants to do in me, with me, for me, through me. And you know, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen in this new year. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, just obey him regardless of what's going on, because he's in control. And I can trust him. I'm going to follow him. You know, the last thing that happens is, actually the last word before everything goes silent in this the story. Verse 14, all the angels gather multitude and they sing glory to God in the highest. Because again, it's all about the glory of God. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. That's the best translation of what the text actually says. Peace among those with whom, who is God pleased with? Well, we know he's pleased with the Son, the Lord Jesus. Because you remember when Jesus was being baptized? God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We also know God is pleased with those who trusted his, his son, Jesus Christ, we, who we know he is pleased with. And because of Christ being in us and us receiving his righteousness, we become pleasing to the Father. This baby became a man whom God was pleased and by trusting him as Savior, all the displeasure in my life, the sin, the rebellion, the ugliness, all of that is forgiven, is cleansed, and I become pleasing to the Father. That's the Christmas story. That's how I want to live my life.